Welcome to the 63rd episode of the Game 4 Podcast. In this episode, we'll talk about the world of print-and-play tabletop games. I'm Adam. I'm Matt. And this is the Game 4 Podcast. Game 4 is a platform to help connect tabletop gamers and to help you get more of your tabletop gaming. Matt and I are part of a software development design company called Milk Can. And because most of the folks at Milk Can love tabletop games, we developed the Game 4 app and launched it in early 2018. We launched the Companion Podcast in June 2019 to help tabletop gamers get more enjoyment out of their hobby. Due to the COVID-19 global pandemic, we hibernated the Game 4 app in July of 2020 and plan to bring back a retooled version of the app for Android, iOS, and web when gaming in person is safer. Until then, we'll keep bringing you this podcast to help you get more out of your tabletop gaming. You know, I think... Oh no, I'm good. I thought that my... um, a little pop filter f- uh, fuzzy thing was off, but it's, uh, it seems all right. I was, that's the one thing I didn't check before we started. Yeah. So how's things? How's, uh, how's hobbying? I know that you've got your basement basically dialed in now, and so maybe some things have been getting started? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm still kind of cleaning up and reorganizing, but uh, things are being I know, cleared out. I know, I know nothing about that. <laughs> um and then like i just finished up that um really large print i did for one customer the train it was the uh for star wars legion yeah it's like that is it like the train the from train. the solo movie yeah like they did that train heist on the solo movie I yeah wanna, i want to watch that movie yeah again. he did like we did extra cars for him and everything so and he's gonna be using it for star wars legion yeah That's so cool. it was I, I should have checked. I did not see what the final like shipping weight was, but I want to say it was like probably would not be an exaggeration to say three or four rolls of spools of uh, filament. Yeah, it sounds like a big project. Yeah, so that that and was now this person a lot gets to paint too. all that too. Yep. Yeah. So it it is it was shipped and arrived on Monday. So nice um, mission accomplished. Yeah. So those that's done. But yeah, I've started play, painting some of the black orcs and. Yeah, starting to and you've started and you've been printing also along this time some of the the terrain that I at yeah, got you to, yeah. to print. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, that's uh, almost done. Yeah, that stuff's from um, terrainmachine dot com, and it's cool sci fi buildings that I'm going to use for Stargrave, Planet Twenty Eight, Space Weirdos, whatever you know, all kinds of stuff like that. But they're they've been really cool, and I'm I'm. I need to get them painted before it gets... T- I need to get them at least primed with a rattle can before it gets too gross outside. You know what I mean? Like, we're it's mid-October right now, and we're kind of riding that line where if I can find it, you know, and still get out there and spray that stuff. Because I kind of like to have a good, like, real good rattle can base on terrain. You know what I mean? So, I don't know. But that's what I'm hoping to do uh, soon, because I've got two of them already basically done, and they looked great. So I was really happy with that. But you've been working on your black orcs as well, eh? Yeah, so yeah. we can get to Blood Bowl t- mm-hmm. 2. Mm-hmm. I, I want to play a Season 2 before I, they release Season 3. <laughs> yeah, no, I can understand that. I know I was talking with um, Jason recently about Blood Bowl 2, so you guys can probably play together, I'm assuming, because he's got, I think, something finished, doesn't he? Doesn't he have humans, maybe? I think he does, yeah. yeah. I know that you yeah, have some others that are out there that in the area that are wanting to play, so yeah. yeah. It's good to see some of that starting again, but it's not happening everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's see. What have I been doing? Um, well, I so I received a Kickstarter. I've actually received two Kickstarters recently. I received uh, a Kickstarter from Empire's Fall, which is from Gaddis Gaming. Oh, yeah. I got mine, too. No, oh, did you? Yep. Nice. Yeah, so I got mine finally, and, um, well, not even finally. I'm pretty sure it was on time. It was... Yeah. Or real close. I mean, especially for being in the pandemic, too. It was, Absolutely. It was pretty good. Yeah, because you, yours was all painted, right? Yeah, right. I, I did the level where my stuff was painted, so that was very cool, too. So, yeah, I looked it over, and it's cool stuff, and uh, that's neat. Um, there was one, like, gun on one tank turret that got, like, unglued in, in transit, but that'll be a simple glue job to fix that up. Not a problem. Um, so I got that, but then uh, talking about finally, I did finally get... Uh, the Car Wars Kickstarter that I had ordered in, I don't even remember when. It might have been 2018, like late, but it might have been 2019. I don't remember. And it was supposed to ship by November 2020, but of course, yeah, you know, it was pandemic. when you went to Texas, yeah. Well, I went to Texas in, you know, now that you mention it, you're right. It was I went to Texas in April of 2019, and they didn't have the Kickstarter until after that. So it was later than that, but still. Uh, it did finally show up, almost a year late, but you know, a 
pandemic, which I totally understand, and B, you know, I've never gotten a Kickstarter from Steve Jackson that showed up on the date that they said it was going to, but, you know, to be fair, this is really actually actually my only second Kickstarter from them. The first one was Ogre, which was really, really late, but that was back in the day. Anyway, I've been painting some cars, because it comes with plastic cars, um, is a streamlined kind of different version of the game. It's not like the old version. This is what they call 6th mm-hmm. edition, and now, in the past, you just moved around little cardboard chips that had your car like you know drawn on it you know from top down view and stuff like that and you played on a grid map and now it's more if i gotta find something that it's kind of close to it reminds me a lot more of star wars x-wing you know what i mean where you're playing with like minis on a a table on a mat or whatever and you've Mm -hmm. got like kind of little rulers that sort of steer and sliding and all kinds of stuff like that and everything so um and your weapons are cards you know and kind of stuff like that so it does have a bit of a x-wing vibe but uh, i've been painting some of the cars i finished three of them put them up on instagram yeah, yeah. We were, you were showing me the the desert thing you yeah said, yeah that was really cool though. yeah it was a lot of fun and so i'm gonna be working on more of those i have six more of them sitting i have three more sitting on my hobby table right now that i need to finish and then i have six more that are sitting in my airbrush room that need to get primed so nice. uh, i'm working oh. on that and i'm not spending tons of time on them to be perfectly frank because they're not honestly the best sculpts in the world there's a lot of like kind of chunky mold lines and issues like that but mm. these are not you know fancy schmancy space marines or, or you know aliens or whatever these are sure. cars and i'm going to paint them up kind of be mad max and so it's fun um but yeah otherwise i've been working on uh chaos warband for war cry i've been doing that on twitch i've only got like the two guys left which are still you know big dudes one of them's a chaos hero standing you know, and of course the hero pose or whatever. Chaos hero is maybe the wrong term. He's a chaos warlord, I guess, but he's a you know he's a, a leader character. Let's say that. Mm. Uh, but he's got the you know the the leg up like he's um, Captain Morgan. You know, like he's trying to sell, oh, like, yeah, sell yeah, me yeah. some rum, right? <laughs> so he's got that going on for him, which is nice. nice. Uh, and then the other guy is riding on a big weird lizard dog, and that guy I haven't gotten very far at all. But I'm almost I'm getting towards the end on the um, the standing guy, so that's not too bad. Nice. Um, and then, um, as we're recording this, this is Tuesday, and on Friday, after I get done with my Twitch stream, I'm getting in the car and driving to Lake Geneva, Switzerland. No, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And I'm going to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin for Dragonfall, nice. which is a convention that is predominantly miniatures-oriented, and it is not real big. Uh, last time they did it in 2019, it was maybe three, 400 people, somewhere in oh. there. So wh- do you know why it's called Dragonfall? Uh, because dragons are cool, and it's in the fall. Oh. I, I just made that up. I have no idea, but I'm assuming it's something like that. Um, I, yeah, I was trying to think, because like, you would think with like when you hear dragons and mm-hmm. Lake Geneva, you're like, oh, it's got to be D&D. Well, but here's the thing, though, is that this is actually the first time they've done it in Lake Geneva. It used ah, to be, yeah, it okay. used to be in like Aurora to... or Naperville or Naperville, somewhere. It yeah. used to be in like northern Illinois, and then this year okay. they moved it to basically the same place that they do Gary Con. Yeah, so okay, yeah, so yeah. I wasn't going crazy when I No, thought. no, 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 no. Yeah, this is a new thing for them. They haven't done it in Wisconsin before, okay. so it's actually closer for me, which is nice. Um and it's all about me, Lord knows. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to that, and I'm going to see uh, a bunch of friends there that I haven't seen in several years uh, because of things. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it'll be fun. I'm going. I'm not going to play, like, in a tournament or anything, although they do have plenty of tournaments and stuff like that. I might do some demos if things pop up, but I'm also bringing Warcry with me. So, um, at the very least, me and some friends will be there and be able to sit down and play some games, and that'll be cool, too. And, um, and yeah, so that'll be... Like I said, I'll be leaving Friday afternoon, and I'll come back sometime on Sunday, probably afternoonish. I'm assuming. So yeah, but yeah, that's um, I think that's pretty much me in a nutshell. You're you're gonna make that joke from I the was going awesome to, but then I'm like, how yeah. do I do it on a podcast? Right, it's hard to do you know, without the visual. I get that. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so have we? Did, we haven't made any updates to Game Manager, have we? Uh, game nothing that's been manager? released, but we've got uh, we've got active development on Game Manager. Um, mm-hmm. There's a f- few features we're adding and some other stuff. So nice, nice. That uh, will be coming soon, mm-hmm. and then um, and that stuff is also stuff that's also needed for Game Four. So mm-hmm. we're kind of working on both at the same time. Yep. So And Game Four work is continuing. Um, we've got things going on there, so that's cool. Um, 
And, you know, it, we're seeing, at least here in the United States, we are seeing hospitalization numbers and things like that trending downwards again, right? I think so in most places, yeah. It's interesting Over. about how that doesn't show up in the news as much. You know what I mean? Like when the numbers are going crazy and everything, then that you hear about it over and over and over again. And as soon as things start to kind of get a little better, that you don't seem to hear about it as Although, much. Although, I don't know that they're like a thing. lot better, but. Yeah. Well, sure, exactly. If you start telling people, hey, everything's better, then they're going to go around and start licking doorknobs again. Right. And then, you know, back where we started. So maybe that's the that's, idea. I'm guessing that's probably. And oh, sure. Still, I no, mean, I'm sure that the media is definitely thinking of our best Yeah, interest. I know that there's still people in our area that have died. So, oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, recently, so. Yeah. So. Well, we're still, you know, and, and, and again, this is just the United States. Uh, Game 4 being a global thing, we're still also keeping an eye because there's plenty of company or countries that are still also in, in different phases of lockdown and things like that. So we've got that going as well. But uh, we are making forward progress on the app, and um, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, some gaming types today that they have a couple of, and I didn't even think I put this, I think I might have put this in the benefits section, but... Y- the global pandemic has caused a bunch of shipping problems. Yes. Supply chain, all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, right. it's thrown it, in, and then, yeah, and then it seems like all the news you hear are just things that make it that much worse. Right. I just saw a thing recently basically saying that the, the president canceled Christmas. Uh, that sounds like him. Well, it, what, what they were saying was basically no, that he came out and was like, oh, well, you know, understand that it's going to be hard to find things in stores a little bit just because of, you know, sh- shipping. Uh, yeah. And everyone keeps hearing more and more about this global uh, supply chain. We've talked about a thing uh, here. Um, so what we're talking about today is kind of related to that. Uh, these are called print and play games. Now, I have a vague idea of what they were, uh, but then started doing some research and found it was pretty interesting, honestly. Yeah, like when you started showing me stuff, like it was not what I... Th- I When you were like, oh, let's talk about print and play, I was right. like, okay, yep. And I was thinking of probably like the print and play from 15 years ago. like. Well, and, and still like, okay, so, you know, uh, we released the game, uh, Vince and I released our game, Rain in Hell, and it's on the wargamevault.com. Mm-hmm. And there are plenty of games on there that are PDF only, which in my mind, that means print and play. Well, as it turns out, no. That's not okay. what they... Uh, it, if, uh, looking at the article on um, Board Game Geek, if it's just a booklet, like it's a PDF that you use for playing, that's yeah. not technically considered print and play. So there's a guy that in the corner, if I called that your game print and play would right. go actually. Well, actually, yes. No, that's very true. Okay. A very good point, yes. Um, but so the whole thing, though, is that a lot of the stuff that I see on Wargame Vault and also to some degree on, um, you know, uh, drive through RPG and places like that, not necessarily the best production value. Like, they're not spending much money on art or layout or things like that. I've been, and I think it's partially because of some of the places we looked at, they're very curated collections, which we'll talk about in a bit. Yeah. But a lot of these games that we've been looking at, just you and I, over the research on this, have been really surprisingly good-looking games. Yeah, I was like... Like was visually, shocked. like like there's they're spending money on art and mm-hmm. stuff like that. You know what I mean? It, yeah, drew me in to... Yeah, it's not like what I remember seeing, you know, with like a Ziploc bag mm-hmm. and, and stuff. And I was like, oh, wow, that's... Somebody put a lot of care and thought into this. Absolutely, absolutely. So the concept behind um, print and play games is they are generally a little bit more board gamey or card gamey uh, than uh, than than just like a booklet. So like RPGs, you know, you get a PDF that's an RPG, whether it's a source book or whatever. That's not technically print and play, though you do technically sometimes print it and then play with it. Mm-hmm. But as far as the 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 nomenclature, print and play is aiming towards games that are generally more in the board game and the card game area. So probably stuff. So probably a good way to do that is if you could play the game but still only be on your iPad. Mm. It's probably not print and play, it's right? It's just a PDF. Yep, and yeah, yeah. Because I honestly version. don't print like most of the digital stuff that I do buy is just it stays on my iPad. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's true. Not everything, but a good. A good but yeah, it'd be hard to hand out little cards and right. I don't doing like the little pieces that we were looking at that exactly exactly okay. so yeah so a lot of those games are definitely um board game or card game kind of oriented but they are something that you are going to download very frequently as a pdf mm-hmm. and then you print it out yourself um 
and uh, and and so you you know you bypass that whole global supply chain kerfuffle. Yay. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Uh, unless you don't have any paper, I guess. Or you're out of ink, and right? And all the ink no is ones. all the ink is in a tr- uh, shipping container off the coast of uh, Louisiana or whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so what are but some for the, now? But for now, <laughs> until then, you're you're good. So some what are some of the benefits to players um, for this for this type of game? Mm-hmm. Um, well, one of the biggest ones is that they are generally quite cheap, if not free, in some situations. Yeah. So like, whereas board games, I mean, depending on components and stuff you're going 40 to you know over 100 oh yeah u.s absolutely. dollars yeah exactly um whereas like when we were looking at uh one of the uh companies that does like that's one of those kind of curated like here's mm-hmm. a, a we we sell these these pdfs it's like a marketplace an online marketplace for print and pr- play games i had a hard find time finding a print and play game that was over three bucks yeah so They're it's mostly three bucks or right less. it reminded me of kind of like you know your uh your phone app store prices mm, yep yep like free to just a few bucks most for most things mm-hmm. yeah no i agree um so that's a that's kind of a benefit for folks that just want to be able to like try a bunch of different things out if you're like geez i'd like to try these six different board games out well mm-hmm. that's expensive you know and it takes up a ton of space and all kinds of but if you're just like hey these six games i'll buy them that might be 18 dollars plus tax you know what i mean mm-hmm. like could be less um so that's c- kind of interesting there and then, uh, you know, instant delivery, so you're not having to wait. You're not having to wait for it to get shipped from right. the U.K. or the E.U. or Australia or whatever. No matter where you are, you're going to get it pretty quickly, which is nice. Unless you're, like, you know, still dial-up. Or... I guess. If there's somebody still on dial-up, then, yeah, that's going to take a little bit of time. Um, and then there's no shipping fees either. So it's like, you know, there's a lot of times when you look at something, you're like, this is very cool. And then you're like, it's going to cost as much to buy it as it right. is going to ship it to where <laughs> I live or whatever. And this doesn't have, you know, doesn't, not a situation. Um, and so that's kind of cool. And then, and this is the interesting thing that I guess I hadn't thought about, but as a hobby nerd, it sort of makes sense, especially also as a guy who's into like layout and graphics and junk like okay. that. Um, many people see like the the act of sitting down and printing their P and P games. Their uh-huh. their P and P is for print and play. Ooh. I know. Yeah, yeah. Uh you're you are the I'm fancy that way. Yeah. Um they see that kind of as a hobby in itself. So, you know, you get this PDF and you're like, okay, cool. Well you're gonna print it off not just on like a regular piece of paper, but you're gonna maybe print it off on fancy cardstock. And then you've got like maybe a laminator, you know, that you use you laminate oh, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And like there are like these things you can get at the craft stores and stuff that will round corners. So it's like a punch. Oh. So you put it on the corner of yeah, like a square yeah. thing. So you cut out these square cards, but you want them to have nice rounded corners, yeah. like regular playing cards. So you buy this little thing, you put it on, you just go punch, and then it punches and it rounds the corner. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So the production value like really goes up if you want to take the time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like when like so, I'm not going to call myself a print and play uh, a pioneer here, but um, a long time ago, my friend Peter and I had a, a small game company called Snarling Badger Games. Uh, Vincent uh, Venturella and I now have a game company called Snarling Badger Studios. They're totally different. Um, but anyway, back in the day, Peter and I made a card game called Zombie Rally, and it was a card game that we got printed like at a local printing place, and it was a thing, it was a physical thing that you bought and the whole deal. But then once we were done with the whole print run, people were like, well, can I just buy the PDF? And you're we like, why would you want to print out your own card game? That doesn't <laughs> make any sense. Well, what we found out people were doing, because we, 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 you know, we made a PDF and put it up on drive through rpg or one of those sites mm-hmm. and people started buying it and we were like what the why <laughs> and well what it was was they would just print them out on like regular copier type paper or regular yeah. printer paper and then they would take like magic card sleeves they'd put like a common you know garbage magic card in it for stiffness and then just slide the the, the paper in front of it oh. and it's if you're used to playing magic and yeah. you're used to using sleeves all right. the time this is no different so it doesn't feel any different yeah so that's what people were doing. Now, admittedly, the cards were only in black and white anyway, because we never had even printed them in color or whatever, but still people were doing it. So, mm-hmm. you know, and that was back in the 2000s or, yeah, early 2000s. So that that was cool, you know, um, and you can do that, but you can also go way further with it. You don't want to sleeve your stuff, but you want fancy, like, you know, double-sided and card stock and the rounded corners. You can get real fancy. I've, I've heard of people actually, like, using some sort of, like, um, Almost like a wax on the cards to give them better card oh, wow. feel. Oh yeah, no people people will go 
surprisingly ham on uh, on trying to you know on doing this stuff, and I'm like, you know, you paid three dollars for this, right? I mean, uh, that's cool, you know. I mean, yeah, but whatever I mean, you want to do to pass the time, yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, the other thing that's interesting is the games are generally kind of small, like physically small. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of them that I was looking at, they will tell you, like, depending on the website, they will be like, oh, yeah, this will this will take four pieces of paper, and then you will cut it up, and you will get, you know, an instruction booklet and 27 cards or 18 cards or stuff like that. Generally, on an 8.5 by 11 size piece of paper, you get nine cards. Like, if you, you know, make them standard kind of whatever card size, like magic card size or whatever, mm-hmm. you can generally fit, like, nine, I think, uh, roughly onto a normal piece of paper and so then that's kind of like the number so you see a lot of multiples of like nine in a lot of these type of games um i've seen a bunch of these games that are basically always like well it's 18 cards you know and like so you 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 know you you kind of do that so it's not like you're you know printing out a stack of paper you're printing out a little bit of stuff and it's not too bad but yeah i mean you can take it with you and oh exactly like i was yeah i was thinking you were showing me something i was like oh my gosh if i was being you know I was a scientist and I was going to Antarctica, like, you know, they, oh, or yeah. like in space, you know, they always talk about like, well, you know, you can't, you can't really take much with you. You could take like a thousand of these games with you. Oh yeah. If like you had like a shoe box, like a standard size shoe box, you could fit dozens of these into a shoe box along with dice and tokens and little pieces that you might need for the game. Cause not all of these games, sometimes these games do need, you know, some dice or they need some little, you know, maybe some cubes or some little chips okay, or something, yep. to, you know, but, but they, you know, um, but but generally, yeah, you could put you could put a lot like you could put inside of a normal board game. You could put so many of these games inside one of those boxes, like so many. Yeah, it'd be really easy. Um, and so that's kind of nice too. It's also nice for like, you know, we used to my friend Peter and I when the game that we produced uh, Zombie Rally, um, we would tell people because they'd be like, well, I don't know, I don't really play a lot of card games. And all like, you know, what do you play? Well, we, we play role playing games, and you'd be like, oh, well are you ever waiting for someone to show up at a role playing game mm-hmm. and they're like yeah all the time like we're all like bob's got to go and pick up his sister or you know S- S- sally's not here yet or whatever right. or we're waiting for pizza or something like that there's always downtime we're like you could just easily right here play a game uh you know with the, and you just have it it's a small little deck of cards yeah. you slide it into your stuff your backpack you pull it out play a game and you're not wasting time sitting around That's, oh yeah now admittedly that was back before phones I mean, you know, right, there, were, there but were phones, like, but I not see cell this phones. Like, like when you go to Dragonfall, sure. But like more like when you're at Gen Con, you're like waiting to get into like a, uh, like session, a seminar or something, sure, stuff like that, and yeah, playing yeah, yeah. that, to like mm-hmm. in line with your friends, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. The, like having a small little game that's easy to play and, and pull around and stuff like that is um, is very cool. And so that's what's really interesting, I think, about some of this this print and play stuff. Um, if parts are needed, like I mentioned before, like okay, pawns yeah. or little colored cubes or dice or whatever, very frequently you can reuse, like, you know, like if you've, you could carry a bag that's got dice, a bunch of different cubes, chips, all that stuff in it, which would probably be enough stuff for multiple games. So you don't have to have like, oh, I have to have dice for this game and I have to have different dice for this game. And You know what I mean? Like generally, right, right. like they, they generally stick to six-siders. Not always, but they generally stick to six-siders. So um, again, if you're going to bring a bunch of different print-and-play games, you can do some really kind of interesting stuff by maybe having like one of those, you know, those, those clear like tackle box kind of like divider. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like storagey things. Mm-hmm. You could just fill that full of a bunch of different parts and stuff you'd need for um, for the games, the multiple games, and that'd be very cool. Um. And then I think something else that's not like a physical thing or anything is that these these print and play games because they're not particularly difficult to produce um, and they're not particularly you know you don't have to worry about shipping and this and that and all that kind of stuff. Um, more interesting game styles that you know can show up that might not get published otherwise. Yeah. You know, like if you if you're a big game publisher and you're looking at this game design, and you're like. This is very niche. I just don't know. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, if you're a, you can, if you've at least got your some skill with uh, layout stuff or whatever, or art direction or something like that, or maybe you've got a friend who does and you can kind of rope them into it, you can produce your print and play game yeah. pretty easily. And then, therefore, the people buying it would be like, no one would have ever made this game if it was a regular, like, mainstream style game. Sure. When I say mainstream, I don't mean. 
Monopoly or, you know, right, sorry, talking I'm talking like, like traditional like, publisher games. Like, you know, Catan and Carcassonne and the stuff that's very popular within hobby board games, I guess. Is that the technical term you think? Hobby board games versus just regular like family board games? That's as good of one as any. Let's use that. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> copyright. So says copyright, Adam. So copyright says TM uh, Game Four LLC. Um, so yeah, that's. I think that's an important thing too. Um, the, um, it, it, you know, because I, there's a lot of games out there, sure, but there's also really interesting things that nobody would ever like. You you might even make a game that like even as a Kickstarter, people would be like, Nah, I'm good, man. But there's going to be like three dozen people that might be like, This is dope, and I really like it. Right. And you know, you're not like having to buy 10,000 of them and have them you know, take up all the space in your garage. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then hope that people buy them. You, so that's that's one of the big benefits as well, I think. Um, so speaking about benefits to designers, okay, to the people who are actually making these games, I think that there are plenty. Um, now, I'm going to say this, of course, as a person who has just recently self-published some stuff themselves and is uh, relatively keen on the concept. Um, and I think that more people, especially in this day and age, should do it because they can do it. If mm-hmm. you're interested, you know, don't be like, well, I really got to get the attention of some big publisher so they'll print it and make me a zillion dollars because, A, that doesn't happen. Just straight, neither, of those, neither of those parts really happens, yeah. Uh, well, the zillion dollars certainly doesn't happen. Um, I don't know. I, I've got a couple friends. And, well, yeah, okay. no. But, yeah, so it, it's a situation of being able to self-publish and kind of be DIY about it, I think, is really interesting as well. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that I think is most interesting to some degree about these types of print-and-play games is that they have a lot of limitations. And those limitations can drive creativity. When you are saying, mm-hmm. I'm going to design this game, like this has happened to me before. I've had people walk up to me at conventions. Like back in the day when Peter and I were going to like local conventions and like selling our, our games. Yep. People would go walk up and be like, okay, well, yeah, I've got th- this looks cool, great, sure. And they wouldn't buy it ever, you know. And then they would uh, be like, well, I got this idea for this game. It's super cool. And I've been working on it for a really long time, you know, on nights and weekends and stuff. And you're like, oh, that's really cool. You should publish it yourself. And they're like, well, you know, it has 600 cards and it's on a <laughs> three foot by three foot board. And, you know, this and that and blah, 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 and all this. And you're like, well, you got to dial that back. That's, 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 um, that's not a good idea. But no, you like, 550 is plenty. 550 cards, fine. 600, way over the line. <laughs> no, I agree. But the situation is that it, it, when you're like, okay, I need to design a game and I need to go maybe 18 cards. Mm-hmm. Maybe I can do 27. Is that the next? That's the next multiple. You're better at math than I am. Yes, I'm pretty yes. sure that's the next. Yes, 18, 27. Yes. yes. Multiples of nine. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, because it adds up to nine. Right, yes. Seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. It, it, are you trying to tell which one hands the left hand? No, which no, one's no, the right if, one? Oh, you were if counting. You put, if you put the finger down, Whoa. if you count from the left to the right. Okay. So if I so I'm doing three, you can go one, two, three. Yeah. It's two and then seven. Is this the new math? No. This okay. is old. Oh, wow. But yeah, it's is that why we use ten based? Because we have ten fingers? Yes. <laughs> I okay, all right. I didn't expect the answer to be yes that quickly. I kind of yeah, thought no. that no. Okay, no, all right. I thought it was yeah. That's, else. Yeah, a lot of your sci fi's. That's they'll like talk about like different different bases and because it's based it's based on the, fingers, huh? Well, yes. Yep. We, you learn so many things here on the Game Four podcast, and so do I. <laughs> but anyway, the point is, is that limitations can very frequently drive uh, uh, creativity. Look right. at um, uh, low budget movies. Right, you know what I mean, like that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Yeah, so it, yeah, like it, you know, and think about it. Like if somebody says, "Like, draw me a picture," you can you you almost block yourself. You're like, "I draw a picture of what?" Sure. But as soon as you start going, "Well, draw me a picture of the ocean," mm-hmm. okay, or "Draw me a picture of this, this, and this," then it's like all of a sudden you start spawning ideas and creativity. And right, stuff because you've got like a direction, and and y- your game could be about whatever. But when you're like, but it has to fit into this particular. It has to be a PDF. It can't have big crazy miniatures. I mean, you could use miniatures. The person could use miniatures if they yeah. wanted to. But thinking about what is the package? What this is going to be a PDF, and we want people to download it and print. It. In many situations, as few pa- like if you tell somebody, "Hey, this is my print and play game. It's going to be twenty seven pieces of paper." Mm-hmm. you know, full color, and you're going to have to cut out all these cards and go through all that, they're going to be like, mm, I don't know. There are people that will, but it will be a smaller number of people. <laughs> um, but when you tell people, hey, this is... And, and on, on uh, Print and Play Arcade, which we'll talk about in a little while, on a lot of those listings, they'll tell you, this is four pieces of paper. This is three pieces of paper. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, no, um, was, 
Now, is it like back and front? Like, do you need a double sided printer? Uh, well, you, for some of them, I, that's a good question. I don't know. Okay. Um, I think if you want it to look really fancy, like a lot of people, again, like if they're using like the magic card kind of thing that I was talking about before, yeah, yeah, where you yeah. slide it in sleeves and it doesn't matter. But if you're like, I want to print my own cards and make them fancy, like when we did it for ours, we gave people uh, the what the because when we printed the stuff ourselves, we obviously had backs of the cards in front of the cards. Mm-hmm. And when we did the the PDF for people, we gave them that back of the card PDF. So if they wanted to print that on the back of it, then you just basically, you don't even need a two-sided printer. You can just be like, I mean, if you have a double-sided yeah, printer, you, that's cool, but otherwise you can just print it once and then put them back in and then print the yeah, other Yeah, I was stuff. thinking more because I, I would think it would be tough for the designer to know how to line stuff up. But maybe it's just it, basically making sure you're within the same um, I suppose. Uh, template or whatever and stuff well, like that. But doesn't it flip? Yeah, you just have to make sure they put it back in the right way. So, yeah. And you also, if you're smart, what you're doing is you're completely centering it in the page. So even, well, you don't want it to be upside down, obviously. So, yeah, right. it takes a little bit of messing around. But to, we, the way we explained it in the website is we told people, print a thing and then draw like a triangle on it and then put it back in the way you think it's supposed to work yep. and do it again and see if the triangle comes out right, up, right side up or upside down. Um, and so that was kind of useful. And then once you know, you know with your printer but um yeah so the creativity thing coming from the limitations like can i make a game like i was looking at a game on on there that is basically like a car racing game but it's 18 cards so you you have your cars and those are a couple of Mm -hmm. cards that you can pick from and then the way that the racing happens is that there's different like kind of like maneuvers on these cards and then you lay down a card in front of your car and then you move your car to the end of the other side of the car but you have to line it up with the way that the thing is going and it's a whole thing and you're trying to miss obstacles and stuff like that it's called turbo drift or something like that turbo it, drift yeah yep. and it looked it looks really cool so yeah, it um, reminded me of the like restoration games is bringing back a new one that reminds me of the um the video game like wasn't Car Wars? What was the game like? It was like NES, and you you were like driving, and you would attack each oh, other. Oh, Road Rage! Road Rage! Yeah, yeah, with the motorcycles. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was like Road Rage, but board game based. And like as you were moving through, like you would tape the board after you guys finish a board that gets added to the next. Yep. Yeah, a lot of car or any kind of like road style games. Yeah, once you pass the last tile, you take the last tile off and you put it at the front, and then you keep keep get the road going. Yeah, that was the way that. Um, Games Workshop made a game a long time ago called Dark Future that had that same kind of deal. Mm. It was like a car, like fighting game, but you were all driving the same direction and stuff like that. And now they made a computer game of it. And now you don't have to do that with the tiles anymore because it's on the computer. Um, another benefit to designers is that there's not a ton of upfront costs. You know what I mean? Like if you want your stuff to look really good, which on some of these sites, there's definitely some of these 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 print and plays that look very, very good. Like they've obviously got bespoke like artwork that they paid people to do and layout and stuff mm. like that. That's got some definite upfront costs, but you're not sitting down and saying, okay, well, we got to do a print run of 5,000 minimum, and then we have to get it shipped from China, and then we have to do this and that. Like all that right. stuff disappears. Warehousing disappears. Like all that stuff is, is gone, mm-hmm. and you can spend the money that you want to on making it look as fancy as you want to. And then you don't have to worry about, but we also have to get it published or, you know, you know, printed and produced and packaged and all those other things that start with P. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's a, that's a, for people who are starting out in design or who are just trying to do it maybe kind of on the side or something like that a little bit. Um, that's, I think, a really cool thing, too, because, you know, it was funny when we printed our first game, Peter and I, yeah, uh, we, it, there was no PDFs. Like this was 92 yeah, I like suppose. there was not Adobe PDF was not a thing, so there was no way for us to even yeah, produce wow. it. Yeah, I'm so just like, I, wow! I didn't realize how. Yeah, I'm just. Yeah. it it seems like it's been here forever. Oh, I know exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, so it was a situation of like the only way for us to produce our own game was to actually get it physically printed and then to take it places and sell it to people and you know go to conventions and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, but nowadays you could easily produce a game and sell it to people worldwide. I mean, you know, Vince and I just did that, uh, and, and it, you don't have to print a thing. I mean, we have print on demand for the, the book and that's cool, but, um, but yeah, so it, it's really kind of interesting. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm very interested to see 
what other designers can do with that. I know a lot of designers always like to think, oh, well, I got to get this, you know, it's got to be in a store, it's got to be on a shelf, otherwise it's not real. Right. And I, I'm a big fan of saying that's not, you can, you, can, you can be indie if you want to. You can be DIY and crank stuff out and, and go from there mm-hmm. and go that direction. Um, let's see here. Uh, quick to produce, I think, also, in memory, especially when you're talking about like 18 cards, let's say, if that's your target. Yep, okay. There's not a lot of work. Like you want to obviously double, you know, test the rules and it's a lot of that stuff. Sure. And there's a lot of tightening and sharpening and figuring everything out. But when it's actually time to do the layout and all that stuff, like you ever played Dominion? Yes. Now a lot of those cards are duplicates, but there's a lot of cards. Oh in yeah, that box. And just the permutations and exactly and stuff. Yeah. So it's... like just like you know sitting there going, well, you know, we still have to make a hundred different cards, which we will then print four or five of each of them in some situations. So we'll have five hundred, six hundred cards in our in our in our set. That's fine. But you could also just do fewer cards, and and you know obviously not. It doesn't work with every game. Dominion wouldn't work if there's only eighteen cards. That would be really weird. I um, mean, yeah, it would be kind of boring. Yeah, it would. So, uh, <laughs> but that's fine, you know. So, um, but it, it's just kind of interesting that way to like look at it from that as- aspect when you're working on these smaller games. You're also looking in situations yeah. where you you know don't have to do as much work, especially with layout and art and all that stuff. If you have to buy like. 50 pieces or 100 pieces of art versus buying 18, let's say. That's right. generally cheaper because it's yep. less. It's less. But, yeah, and then, yeah, it doesn't balloon out as far. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's. I mean, that happens for a lot of things. Like, Oh, absolutely. It's a lot easier for me to, you know, put up a shelf in a bedroom than it is to build a house. Sure. That's true, too. Um, uh, a friend of mine was, uh, when we were at Gen Con, he is building himself like a 2D sprite kind of like video game. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know if he's using like Game Maker or one of those things or if okay. he's actually learning some programming. But he was working on the artwork and he was just building sprites on his iPad like in between. Like we'd be sitting there in the hotel room because we had this, this yeah, kind yeah. of big honking hotel room. And he'd be sitting there just like we'd all be talking and stuff, watching a movie or whatever in between things. And he'd be like working away on sprites and animation and stuff like that. If he was going to try to build like a big 3D, you know, super huge AAA game type of thing, that's obviously not going to work out. He's that's not a thing that one person generally does. So, um, yeah, there's a, I think there's a lot of parallels here, frankly, between this and the indie um, video game right. kind of you know thing. So mm-hmm. definitely. Now it's not all roses. Oh uh, no, I know, I know, it's sad, but it's not all roses. Uh, there are some negatives, both to players and to designers. There's not that many. Uh, it's okay. But uh, negatives to players. Um, I think that the production and quality, it's not always the best. So if you're like expecting every game out there to be Scythe, or you're expecting every game out there to be like Zombicide, mm-hmm. or all this kind of stuff, these, these print and play games are not. Like if, oh. you, if you're just like, I want to open a box and have all, they just be dazzled. Well, okay, cool. But in this situation... You're going to have to, if you're going print and play, like I said, you're going to probably print this stuff off and figure out some sort of way to actually play it. So, yeah. you know, maybe just like there are people out there who don't like miniatures games because they're like, I don't want to build and paint those things. And you're like, okay, cool. Well, right. there's also people out there who are like, I don't want to print and cut out and glue and whatever to make my sure, board sure, game. Sure. I just want to buy the board game. You're like, well, but it won't be $3 then. You know, so there's that too. Um, but yeah, so that's something that, that you as a, as a player kind of have to sort of like... I don't want to say get over because that sounds, you know, combative. But you, it's something you ha- you kind of like have to like get used to. If you're going right. to be interested in the more print and play indie thing, then yeah, there's a little bit more work on your side, right? Because it is a little bit of a hobby. Well, yeah, exactly. And I think that that's you know, I mean, it gives you something to do when uh, you know, when you're not playing. Yeah, no, it's and and, cool, and a bunch yeah. of these games seem to be solo, and I think that's a new thing too. Just yeah. because more people were playing solo games because of the pandemic, I, I, I was as I was going through looking at this, there was a lot of them that were like one to four players, right. which you know then therefore means you can play it by yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, but the production and quality is maybe not always necessarily as best as big as the sixty, seventy, eighty, a hundred dollar games, but that makes sense. Um, and the physical version is, of course, like I said, kind of basically as good as you make it. If you just slip a bunch of black and white, you know, copier paper cutouts that you cut out with a bad pair of scissors, you know, into some magic sleeves, that's what you get. But if you spend a little bit more time, then you get maybe something that's maybe a little bit more what you're thinking about. Um, let me see. What else? Uh, and also, that's another big kind of thing. for If you are 
into big games. And I don't mean, well, physically big is, I guess, implied. Usually, but... well, but Very in-depth. Yeah. Like, you want to play a game that takes six hours. If you're like, my favorite game is Twilight Imperium. There, I don't think, is going to be too many print-and-play Twilight Imperium clones or anything along those lines out there. Probably now, the fact that I just said that means that somebody in the comments would be like, well, actually, there's this and this and this. And I'd be like, I just didn't see that. Everything else looked small from everything all the research I did. Yeah, there, yeah there's probably some that... Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But the general idea behind some They're of these printing plays. pretty quick to play and not Generally, super yeah. deep. You know, yeah. have just a few mechanics and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yep. that that's kind of the standard for the more print and play. But I'm sure, like I said, I know that before Dominion, there was a guy that I knew who before Dominion was in stores, you could, I don't know if you had to buy it or something like that, but you could basically buy the PDF. And then he printed out like all 500 cards for Dominion. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, but in two months, you could just buy it in the store and then not have to yeah. do it. But, but that's what we wanted to do. So we're like, all right, well, that's cool. Yeah. Um, that, was, that was some time ago, obviously. But yeah, it was, um, you know, so th that happens. And there are companies, it's interesting too. You're starting to see some of these companies that are like, we're going to make a print and play version of this game that we already sell and produce just in case you want to go down that road as well and stuff. And that's cool. And sometimes with the same game, it's relatively rare. There are some companies out there, it seems like, that do, uh, we were looking at one, you and I, mm -hmm. um, that has like print and play games, but then they also like, well, we, we printed them and then we put them in, they call them wallet games. It's a yeah, company called that was a cool little Button concept. Shy, Shy Button, something like that. Uh, games. Is it either Button Shy or Shy Button Started games? with B because it was right at the top of the list. Okay, yeah. So I think it was Button Shy. I think it was Button Shy um, yeah. games. And they had some games in there that were cool that were like what they called wallet games. And they came like in this little bifold kind of plastic wallet with the logo on it of the game and all that jazz. And then the cards are in there, but you're looking at generally like a max of 18 cards because you can put nine in each side and then, you know, your, your wallet's kind of full. Um, but then that way you don't have to print and, and do all that stuff. But then they have to obviously get that stuff produced and they put it all together. I think they said on the website they're putting it together by hand and all that stuff. So it's not like, you know. Yeah. But yeah, it's a thing. Um, but yeah, so it, it's interesting. Like, again, there are some negatives in that situation. And then as far as designers, um, you know, though limitations do drive creativity, sometimes limitations are just really limiting. You know what I mean? Like... If you're like, I've got this great idea for a huge, massive space epic, whatever, you know, and you're like, but I got to get it done in 18, maybe 27 cards, then that's troublesome. Is right. What it is. Yeah. 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 Pro it's probably not going to happen. Exactly. So you're going to have to kind of adjust your expectations. If you're like, I really love this kind of game, that kind of game, and it just isn't going to work out, well, then, you know, that's it. But then, you know, you have to temper your design, I think, to some degree, which is, I think, can be, can spur creativity, but... It depends on who you are. Um, the, I think the other big thing, too, is that there's not particularly... It's hard to make a bunch of money. I mean, it's hard to make a bunch of money in tabletop games in general. That's not necessarily an easy thing. Um, there's the old joke that we've mentioned several times aboard before. How do you make a small fortune in tabletop gaming? First, you start with a large fortune. Uh, and so um, at three bucks a pop or cheaper... It, you've got to sell a whole bunch of these, I think, to probably, in general, make a lot of these. But that's, I think, not the point. You know what I mean? Like, if you're getting into game design to make money, that was a bad move right from the get. You probably should have gone into finance or something else. You know what I mean? So it's a situation of trying to figure out, uh, you know, if you're doing this, you know, to make money, I don't think it's the right way to go uh, with it. And then um, I think lastly, as far as designers are concerned... Print and play, like I mentioned before, is a niche within a niche. So as far as exposure and things like that, you know, um, you know, if you if you sat down to do, I don't know, let's say a Kickstarter for a normal, big, fancy, glossy, mm -hmm. sh fancy, schmancy, heavy box game, you're going to get more news outlets and things like that that might be more likely to talk about this thing that you're doing on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. If you're doing a Kickstarter for a print and play game, that's uh, it's attractive to fewer people, I guess, is the point. And so you're less likely to get exposure, which is then less likely to get you sales, and it kind of just... So um, I think that probably the people that seem to be doing the best at it are people that are either doing a bunch of them or are known for it, or they are people who are... I've already been designing these other games for a while, and I've got a bit of a name, and yeah. now I can be like, I'm going to design some small games for funsies, and then people will pick them up because they follow my blog or they follow my YouTube channel right. or they follow my whatever, you know, that kind of thing. D did you find any that had, like, IP-related? Like, I didn't see a single one that was, like, 
based off a movie or a TV show yeah. or a comic book or anything like that. I, it'd be interesting if maybe if some that did, that'd be kind of something. Yeah. I well, think that's probably the money thing. I think honestly, like if you're like, hey, I want to make a Marvel print and oh, play, yeah, you're like, paying the how much? I was right. just thinking <laughs> yeah, of like, yeah. yeah, like if you're like, oh, we've got this movie, it'd be cool to have like someone build a game off of it. But yeah, yeah it's usually the publisher approaching not the right i think it's more the in this situation when, when you're looking at it you're either looking at a company that makes a bunch of them so you and you know you like their stuff and so you keep looking at their website yeah. or you are you know looking for something specific sp- something specific or uh, and we're about to talk about this uh you also might end up showing up on one of the marketplaces um that would, would be be good for that kind of thing as mm. well um so I guess the question then comes down to where do you find out more about these uh, alleged print-and-play games that I've been talking about You know, here for about 45 minutes? Uh, well, um, you, one thing you could do is just go into Google and type in print-and-play uh, games. That's, that's, that's kind of where I started. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. But uh, Board Game Geek, amazingly, no one's surprised by this because this is what Board Game Geek is for, Board Game Geek has a very, very comprehensive list of print-and-play games. Hmm. Um, so I will try to put links in the show notes and such to that page because mm-hmm. it is, when I say very comprehensive, I mean like the first page is like games that start with zero to nine and then like A through C and then it's just like, yeah, like it goes, oh, yeah, it's yeah. like they've got like, it's a very comprehensive list. Um, so that's very cool. You can find all kinds of crazy stuff in there, uh, over there at Board Game Geek, um, in their print and play kind of, um. I don't know what they call it. Not a compendium. They, but it's a big group. It's a big, it's a big listing. It's one of their big geek lists. Um, but the other thing, when I started searching around, uh, especially through that, that board game geek list, the, so many things led back to this website called PNP. So that's Paul, Nancy, Paul, uh, Arcade. Oh, I, was like, I was like, oh, I figured it was just for <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. well, it is, but the you know, it's not it's not P and P, it's P N P. Uh, so yeah, um, printandplayarcade dot com. It's probably one of the most well known online marketplaces for print and play stuff, and that's where we were seeing a bunch of really cool stuff. And they've yeah. got it organized by, um, you know, you can do searches by keyword. You've also got it organized by publishers. You've got it organized by categories. Genres, You've got yeah. all kinds of stuff like there. Yeah. And like I said, majority of them, I still don't remember seeing one that was more than three bucks. Yeah. And that is a curated uh, site. Now, I'll be, I'll be perfectly honest with you. The site is actually nicely done. Yeah. Many of those sites that do that kind of stuff, and I'm still kind of looking over towards um, our friends over at uh, One Bookshelf, a.k.a. Drive Through RPG, a.k.a. Working Vault, uh, those websites are a little old uh, and, um, and a little... Mm, uh, I know that they're working on new stuff. I know that they're. I know one bookshelf is definitely um, working on new stuff. They've got links to their beta, so you can see what the new website's going to look like. But uh, the PMP Arcade is a nice little site, very simple, um, easy to find stuff, and mm-hmm. it works out real nice. And uh, again, it's also curated, meaning that, like, let's say I came up with uh, a print and play game, and it was uh, janky, bad whatever, something, it, not to their liking. They're not going to just, it's not just a marketplace where everybody can just upload. It's you kind of have to be like, they have to look at it and go, yeah, this is this, right, this yeah. passes our sniff test Which or whatever. Nice, yeah, cause exactly. Because otherwise it can just be like, I got to be honest, on some of these marketplaces, it's just like so much trash gets uploaded. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there's probably somebody out there that likes it, but it, we're talking five somebody's max. You know what I mean? And so that can and, be And if those five people can even find it. Right, exactly. Because, because there's a thousand other ones. Just right. Like it. it becomes chaff and it becomes difficult to use the system. So I, I do like PNP Arcade um, quite a bit. I think that they do good work that way. So, um, like I said, that's probably one of the most well-known uh, online marketplaces. And I'll put a link down in the show notes as well to PNP Arcade. Arcade. So, bas- basically, both the, the Board Game Geek list and the PNP Arcade are two notes that I will put into the thing, the text doohickey thing. Um, and then, if you are interested in finding parts, like if you need little colored cubes, or you need more dice, or you need little pawns, or whatever you think you might need... Um, Amazon's not a bad place to go looking for that kind of stuff, certainly. Um, you can find a decent amount of that. And then also um, the Game Crafter has a tendency to, uh, in my notes, I've written down the Game Grafter. Yeah, I, not, I almost I corrected it. And it's I was fine. Like, you, you, well, you should because be that's, right, that's not the right word at all. Yeah, no, it's the Game Crafter. Um, I don't know what is graft. Graft is bad, right? Isn't that graft? No, you graft stuff, like put stuff together. Oh, yeah. So that's why I was like, oh, it could be the name of... Like, yeah, I don't, isn't graft, isn't it like... It's like vice, isn't it? Like a 
No, like you like do like. Well, the, that's another use for the word, but I swear the word graft, like it's like a, something that criminals are. I, mean, I could be wrong. I'll look it up later. Anyway, um, the game <laughs> crafter with a C is the actual proper word, and they sell all kinds of different components there that you can buy. Um, meeples and cubes and this and that and crazy stuff. But you can also find that stuff if you don't have, like if uh, if, you, if you're out, you know, in a different country and you go look on your version of Amazon and probably find that kind of jazz as well. Or what I used to do when I just wanted more six-siders, I would just go to the, um, I would go to uh, places like um, uh, St. Vincent de Paul, uh, Goodwill, you know, oh, like thrift yeah. stores and buy cheap board games mm. for like 50 cents or a buck and then just take the dice out of them and recycle a board game. I just shake down like little kids when they come out of the, the, the game store. I mean, sure, these are these are both different, you know, uh, use cases. But yeah. Because um, <laughs> uh, the dice come right out when you shake them. That's true. Well, unless they got a bag and they got it tied to their belt, that's, uh, as is the, you know, the, the fashion at the time. Um, so yeah, so print and play games, if you're interested in I personally think they work very well as card games. If you're like, it's print and play, but you have to print off a board that is big. That's, But a lot of these games seem to be like maybe a card game where you're building the board. Right. That's kind of cool, you know? Um, and sometimes it's just other types of card games. And yeah, it's it, I think it's pretty interesting as a, as a thing. It's been around for a, a while. This is not anything particularly new. I mm-hmm. mean, it's new enough in that it's mostly based off of PDF. So let's put it that way. But um, yeah, if you're interested in finding out more about print and play stuff, if you're uh, interested in trying out tiny little card games sometimes or tiny little board games and things like that that you get to print out yourself and have fun with, um, you definitely want to check out Board Game Geek's comprehensive list and also PNP Ar- pnparcade.com and, uh, and go from there. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Game 4 Podcast. If you've got questions or comments and you're watching on YouTube, please leave a comment below. If you're listening via your favorite podcast player or you just aren't into the whole YouTube comment section thing, then you can feel free to reach out to us via email at podcast at imgame4.com. You can also keep up to date with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And check out our website at www.imgame4.com. That is www. Dot I A M G A M E F O R dot com. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>